Welcome to uh, this session. This session is part of a global week of trainings. There'll be a lot more sessions running uh, throughout the week and you can uh, see uh, those different sessions and sign up for them um, on our website. And I'm just going to uh, pass on to Maïs, who's our incredible trainer, who's going to take us through this storytelling workshop now. Uh, so thanks, and thanks everyone for being here today, and uh, Maïs, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so happy to be in this space uh, with all of you. Um, I'm going to uh, start sharing screen uh, to introduce for you storytelling public narrative. Uh, and before we go there, uh, I thought maybe it's good to just get to know each other a little bit. Uh, so my question to you is, what gives you hope? So I saw uh, some of you already checking in where you're calling from. So I want you to think what what gives you hope uh, in life and uh, chat it in or just unmute and uh, speak up. We'd love to hear some voices. Uh, my session is usually very interactive, so I depend a lot on your active participation. Um, so I'll go ahead, if it's okay. Yes. Uh, so for me, it's, um, yeah, all of you being around here uh, from around the world, that's give me hope that it's not just me and my colleagues, but yeah, so many people. Yeah, that's one thing. That's lovely. Thank you, Mariana, for sharing. And I see in the chat, uh, the collective power, people around me. Um, the people I work with, it seems a lot of people get their energy and hope from other people. Uh, other thoughts, please keep them coming because uh, as we uh, unpack narrative, hope is a very important element of uh, stories and storytelling and why do we tell stories. Uh, and always finding our sources of hope is something that is inspirational, not only for ourselves, but for others and for other organizers who we work with. Um, I would like to uh, share with you a little bit about myself. Um, I know people are calling here from different parts of the world, uh, so I'll just show you uh, my map uh, for you to see where I come from. So I come from Amman, uh, Jordan. I don't know if anyone been uh, in the Middle East. That's me when I was a child. Uh, I'll stop sharing and just tell you uh, my story. Um, so I remember, um, I remember a very vividly a November a cold afternoon uh, in my home uh, where my father comes back home holding a big plate of knafe. Knafe is an Arabic dessert uh, known for celebrating big events. Uh, and he said, today we celebrate that Mace is a human and she also fails. I smiled in an afternoon I spent crying out loud uh, and being very desperate because I got my first failure uh, grade in math. I got four out of 10 and being a very studious middle child, that was like a big disaster in my life. Um, but that moment was like very memorable for me. And uh, fast forward a few months afterwards, I was in the drama club very enthusiastic about uh, getting into the auditions of the school annual play. Uh, I wanted so much to be the gazelle uh, in that play. Uh, I wanted that role so much. So I was in front of my mirror for a week before the auditions, trying to fix my Arabic pronunciation on the mirror and like, you know, make sure that I practice well for it. Uh, and the next day I went to, to school and went into the audition, like with my heart beating and feeling a lot of uh, suspense around it left feeling that I probably did well, but like I kept waiting for my drama teacher to come out. She came out and she said, well, um, she handed me the script and she said that the first like rehearsal will start on Sunday. Uh, and she said like, make sure to be on time and you're gonna be the school tree. So of course I was uh, devastated. It wasn't what I wanted or expected. Um, and slept that night very uh, frustrated again, like uh, crying so much that like my throat started hurting. Uh, woke up the next morning, saw the script next to my bed and I thought, well, it might as well be a very special treat. So I went back to my mirror and I started practicing the very few lines I got for the play. 
Um, and that experience was a mesmerizing experience for me into like working with a team and having fun with my colleagues and like experiencing what is it to make theater together with other uh, girls in my school. Um, and I did so well in that uh, role that my drama teacher kept increasing my lines and she also nominated me for the uh, what did we call the Jerish Festival, which is like an like a national festival of theater that artists and uh, musicians and like uh, small kids go to like do theater there. So I was like having this bus ride of 40 minutes from Amman to Jerish uh, every day to go do the rehearsals and like sing all the way on the road. And uh, I remember that I was the owl and the lion was always forgetting his lines and I was always like, you know, making sounds for him to remember what he should say, like to just make it work out for the play to work. And um, fast forward, I started getting engaged more with youth and on uh, uh, learning, informal learning setups. I, were, I was running this organization that gives travel grants for youth to travel between one country to another for learning. Uh, and that's when I wanted to really work with these alumni of this program, which was called Safar, which means travel in Arabic. Uh, I wanted to work with these alumni to make them sustain the concept of lifelong learning, and I didn't know what to do. And a friend of mine told me what you're trying to do is called community organizing. Uh, Google someone called Marshall Gans, and I did, and I found that he was running for the second year an online course called Leadership Organizing and Action where he teaches organizing online for activists uh, across the globe. So I subscribed for that course, and that was a true shift for me in 2011. Uh, I took this course and it was like eye-opening for a lot of change that I was trying to do uh, on different levels that I was struggling with and I didn't really know why do people not commit or why these, do these teams work well but other teams don't work well. Uh, why are we like, making uh, actions but not creating the change strategically uh, in the work we're doing so there was a lot of answers that uh, that i received from this knowledge uh, that made me start my own organization called ahel uh, in the arab world where we coach and train campaigns on community organizing um, we celebrated 10 years last year uh, and throughout that journey i met my uh, current husband uh, it was hard for us to live in Jordan or Lebanon where we met uh, because he's a stateless person. So he moved to Sweden for asylum and then I followed him. Uh, and I've been living here in Sweden for six years now. Uh, I organize more on climate, union work. And uh, of course, when I first came, I organized a lot around the question of integration and refugees. Uh, and currently I lead the Leading Change Network, which is basically Marshall Ganz's network organization that brings all these practitioners who are using this framework across the globe together to learn from each other and to cross pollinate uh, things in different countries. Um, so that's, uh, that's about me and I'm gonna just because like for you to know like what's the uh, what the framework is about I, I need to introduce Marshall a little bit as well so Marshall that's him. He's our mentor uh, and he's like uh, he's the founder of the leading change network which i run now um, so marshall was studying at harvard in 1960 uh, and that's when uh, the civil rights movement started afterwards and uh, the freedom summit project asked for volunteers in the summer of 1964. so he left uh, school and he went uh, to uh, to volunteer in the summer project uh, and from there, he like got stuck on organizing from that. He went to organize in California with Cesar Chavez on the workers' uh, rights. Um, and then he received a letter from Harvard asking him to come for the reunion, for the school reunion, for a class he never really graduated. But he decided to go to the reunion anyway. So he went back and there he, uh, he was, uh, you know, encouraged to come complete his degree, his bachelor and document what he has learned. Uh, from the civil rights movement and from uh, the organizing at uh, with Cesar Chavez and that's what he actually did so he was like kind of an interesting graduate of 1960-1992 uh, and he uh, documented the practices which I'm going to talk to you about today one of them being the storytelling public narrative practice um, and he was the architect of the Obama presidential campaign in 2008 um so the the most important thing that uh, i i want to make sure that uh, it comes across is that 
this framework or practices are practices that came from the ground and were documented into theory, into universities, but then they are practiced again in several campaigns around the world. And this communication between uh, and dialogue between the ground and the theory is an ongoing process of learning for us to develop this framework further. Um, so, so even when we teach it, uh, we like, uh, you will see, like, I will try to do some theory, but then we always use models uh, to actually debrief them. When we run this, this is like a very short, like two hour session, but when we run the actual workshop of public narrative storytelling, it's usually a full day workshop. There's a lot of practice. So you will have the time to like write your story, say it, you know, get coaching on it and like, you know, debrief that. So practice is the bulk of the work. So usually in any workshop, like 70% of the time would be actual practice of the work for you to get the the framework uh, and then of course debriefing and reflecting on what we studied so with that i want to say that i would like uh, introduce uh, organizing a narrative we will take a break and then we will dive deeper a little bit more into the story of self which is the first part of the public narrative but to be able to do that uh, collaboratively uh, i want to see like what are some norms that um, would be helpful to facilitate your learning uh, and to facilitate you being here in this space um, so if anyone has something to propose around how we will work with each other what are things that we need to honor or respect uh, for us to work collaboratively during these coming uh, hour and 45 minutes Rami, you have a like a message of slow down. Is that uh, intentional? Do you want to like unmute, speak up, tell us what you need? Let me maybe be more um, specific on questions. So I've planned an agenda with a five minutes break. We have two hours together. Is five minutes break sufficient or anyone feels they need like they need it to be 10 minutes? Um, any thoughts around that? Frank is giving me thumbs up. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, I want to say okay. Then I'm like I'm gonna I'm gonna ask something else. Like I'm usually in my workshops, I like to do some warm calling. Like I I open the space for people to step up, but then um, sometimes I just call names that I see around to make sure that I actually uh, get some responses. Anyone has a problem with being called like? If I call your name to answer a question or to engage with me in a conversation, um, anyone has a problem with that? Okay, so I got some messages to uh, clarify for me who's open for that. Okay, Victoria, since you um, you said yes, I'm gonna be calling you now to uh, to see if you have other uh, norms that you would like to bring up. Thank you, Elif and Irina. Uh... Hello. Um, I guess um, maybe giving uh, what if we have a discussion of some sort, giving some people um, a maximum amount of time to speak so that the discussion, uh, well, as many people can participate in the discussion. Um, I don't know whether for some activities I could two minutes three minutes might be a good um, amount of time and obviously um just principles like um giving people or respecting the ideas that are quite different to ours yeah thank you victoria for bringing out uh, respect um uh, and I wonder, uh, like, uh, what are some practices? Sometimes when we say norms, it's like a little bit vague, but like, what are things that we can do that shows that we have been listening or that we are actually respecting the different views? Uh, if someone has a specific suggestion on how we can actually practice respect for each other, uh, please chat them in or speak up. This is Phyllis. We can... Um acknowledge like with a plus in the chat or clapping uh, emoji from the reactions below that um, we appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. 
so creating uh, using the space the technological space for tools to make us acknowledge each other uh, thank you appreciate that uh, other thoughts maybe what to about... respect each other we should raise our hand when the discussion starts uh, so we will know who will be first second and so on and so on okay Okay, and I just want to say, Arina, that uh, uh, I mean, now I'm happy that people are like uh, becoming more active and uh, participating. I really hope we have a problem of uh, participation and like uh, engagement, uh, but that's good. That's a good problem to have, having more voices to hear and more faces to see um, would be helpful. So these are our initial norms. Norms are uh, working values and cultures that we create and we can always add to it. Uh, so if throughout the session someone wanted to raise something, uh, please do. Uh, and I think I want to like also raise the uh, like a good norm to have in such a session, which is like step up, step down. If you feel you've been silent for a lot of time, maybe it's time to speak. So speak up. If you feel you've been talking a lot, maybe it's time to step down to like uh, allow others to speak. So I think these this helps us like really hear more voices and get all your opinions and thoughts here. Um, okay, so, and even those who are saying like they are in the office or for different circumstances, they can't speak up. I really hope we can like hear you in the chat and uh, listen to your opinions. Uh, so moving on, uh, I would like to, uh, like before going into storytelling and public narrative, because we consider it one of the, five practices, I would like to give you a big picture around organizing before we go there. So uh, in organizing, we start with, uh, in this framework of organizing, we start with the question of who are our people? And then we say, okay, these people that we have, who are our people, what's, what resources do they have? What power do they have to create the change that they would like to see and seek? Uh, I know there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of organizations or a lot of uh, other disciplines in organizing where you start with the issue, but in this framework, we start with the people and these people from their stories, from what they've experienced, we figure out what are the priorities, what are the, uh, and they lead the change that they want to see using their own resources. So that's the essence of this framework. And um, we define organizing as leadership that enables people to turn the resources they have into the power they need to make the change they want. So it all starts from the premise of believing that people are capable and they have the power. It's just a matter of organizing the resources in a way that can make the power shift and for them to become uh, the ones capable of creating the change. And because we use the term leadership a lot, uh, it's good to define it. Um, I know uh, I'm going to explain some types of leadership and if you've ever seen that kind of leadership, maybe you can like either raise a virtual hand or a real hand uh, just to see if you've, you're familiar with these types of leadership. So there is the leader who is uh, who's, who's very busy, always has his phone or her phone ringing. Uh, everyone needs them to approve things or give them the OK on things. So they have like they're very busy. Everything is like kind of coming back to them. If you've experienced that kind of leader or you've been one or like you are one, just like raise a hand just to get a sense of like uh, we, we, we we're familiar with that type. There's the other kind of leaders where a group of like like minded people are all working towards a goal together and they're like aligned. They know what where they're going and they probably mobilize so many others to move with them or to like take action. Um, and that leadership is also uh, probably works for a, for a short time, but like it's not the leadership we're looking for for organizing. And then you have the third, which I think is pretty familiar, the hierarchical, uh, you know, um, bottom down uh, approach, which is like there's a manager who has like department managers or whatever, usually common in like maybe universities or structures of organizations. Uh, where people report to the manager and the manager sends work downward kind of in, in that uh, status. It's also an interesting model, but it's not a model that works for uh, organizing. Westick, yes. 
Is this the hand raised for uh, intervention? No, sorry, it was, uh, as you said, uh, if you ask years, it yeah. leadership, it was for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 good, okay. Uh, so I'm glad, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I think all of us have like, in a way or another experienced uh, one or all of these. And uh, in organizing, we define leadership as accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose in the face of uncertainty. It's a bit packed as a definition, so I will leave it on the screen for a minute. And I want you to chat in what words are standing out for you in this definition of leadership. Billy saying enabling others, Gina saying uncertainty, Afifa also enabling others, uh, Liki, uncertainty, responsibility, Kavita, enabling others. Thank you. Yeah, keep them going. So I, I just want to like, I want one of you to speak up like on like, why is that word in the in the definition like sticking out for you? Like, why, what are you thinking? So whoever from the like participated in the chat or would just like to unmute and speak up would love to hear a voice. Uh, this is Phyllis. I uh, put um, enabling others because you're not going to have a movement if you don't enable others. No matter how talented and hardworking you are, you cannot do the work that many more people will do once you've enabled them. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Philly. That's a very strong point. Um, yeah, uh, and Gina is chatting around, uh, it's because during uncertainty there we need most leadership, but most managers don't necessarily consider the importance of managing that for their teams. Yeah, I think like recently with the like past few years with COVID, people like kind of, you know, Kind of realized uncertainty in its biggest uh, boom but uh, but i think in general people who are actual organizers who are trying to create change on the ground they know that certain uncertainty is given like it's like things never go as planned like you create a strategy and then the opposition makes something else and like you always need to be like kind of ready for things to happen that are unexpected and that's part of the leadership that we actually need uh, people who are comfortable with like having a shared purpose and moving even with despite uncertainty that will happen. So in organizing the structure that we are looking for looks more like that. We call it a snowflake structure because like under a microscope, it looks like how an, how an, uh, how a snowflake would look like. Um, and that's basically uh, what we call like interdependent leadership where it's leadership rich like you can think of these dots as humans or as teams. So you can think of this as a core team that recruited like regional teams and each team recruited even more teams. Uh, and everyone is enabling others to actually work on that movement and work collaboratively on that process. Um, it's not like maybe some people can argue that this model or that model is easier to manage, uh, but these are not sustainable and they are what we call leadership poor. Because at the end of the day, this is a dot in the middle, like it's just one person. And if that person is exhausted, things are over. And the same way for this group. If this group, no matter how, you know, how like-minded they are, if you zoom out, it is a dot in the middle again. And it is a, an isolation of leadership and you're not building more leaders to work with you. So our aim is to build a, a snowflake structure. Our aim is not only to make people actually uh, win campaigns, but also learn how to work collaboratively with each other. So, so there's always an ongoing cycle of recruiting people, of identifying them, the leaders, recruiting them and developing them and identifying them on the same uh, definition that we talked about as leaders are people who enable others. So thinking from that premise of like, I wanna look for people who are open for learning, who are open for enabling others, who look for opportunities to empower each other. So, so in organizing, our ultimate uh, objective is to achieve these three goals. We want a change to happen in the society. So if it is, if you're trying to reduce CO2 emissions, if you're trying to change a policy around something, whatever change you want to create is also what organizing tries to do. But in addition to that, we have two more objectives that are very integral. 
One that is the capacity of teamwork, our capacity to work together, just like what Kavita is writing in the chat. Uh, we can't really create change unless we really work in a team. So in organizing, we work intentionally in making in creating groups that know how to work democratically, that set their norms of working together, that set their roles of working together. And then the individual is an important pillar. So how much the person is knowing and growing and learning throughout that process is something that needs to be very intentional. Because when people learn and grow, they get more committed, they get more motivated to actually participate in this work. Uh, so these are the three outcomes uh, we want to create, because at the end of the day, uh, like whether you're working on climate or on gender or whatever issue is at hand now, uh, unfortunately, there's so many problems. So the issue doesn't need only one campaign. It probably needs multiple campaigns, multiple movements. So that's why we don't just want to win now on this level, on the level of the society. We want to create an infrastructure to win again and again for people after that movement to reorganize themselves again when they see another injustice, when they see another thing. So we need the capacity to organize to actually grow. And that's an important thing. I'm going to stop here and uh, just see your lovely faces and names and see if you have any questions. Any thoughts, questions, reflections? Okay. I know some people said like, you know, I subscribe for storytelling, but that's coming. Just give me a minute. I just want to make sure that you get the full picture of things uh, to not give you like a dissected information. So uh, if there's no questions, I'm moving on. And uh, so I want to like, uh, again, something that we probably all experience. So I'm going to explain this organization, which is a challenge that some of us pass through when we're organizing, when we're trying to create change. This organization suffers from passiveness. You call people for a meeting and they don't show up. It suffers from division. It's not like people have different opinions because different opinions is very important. It's good to have diversity. It's good to have different opinions, but it's more like these people like are good relation with each other and these are good, but like not everyone is kind of united together. And that's a problem Like you don't see the cohesiveness of the team or the group. Uh, you see someone working very hard and they're like very clear that they want to reach point A, that's our goal. And you see someone else in the same office working very hard as well, but they're trying to reach point B. So they're not really aligned on like, where are we? What, what exactly are we working towards? What would be like, what would it look like to have success? What, what is the success we're trying to seek? So that drift uh, situation is also very common. And then you see reactiveness, which is also unfortunately very common that, you know, we just like, wait for a, a murder to happen for us to step up and like you know come up with a voice and be reactive around it instead of just having our own initiative our own strategy and again a lot of this disorganization suffers from a lot of talk and little work so you see people meeting and meeting and meeting but not necessarily doing the work uh, any of these uh, challenges familiar anyone been part of some or all of it yeah Okay, so we all been part of it. And when I came across organizing, that was like a big aha moment when I like heard about this disorganization. So what we really want is people who are active, who are motivated. We need people who are united, who know what is the shared purpose they're going towards, who take initiative and not just wait to react. We want people to do the work and not just talk about it. So that's what we aim for. And that's where the five practices of organizing comes across. So shared story, the public narrative, which I'm going to talk more uh, on in a bit, is what makes us motivated and create our uh, action. Uh, relational commitments, building relations across teams, uh, doing one-to-one -one meetings, house meetings, these tools uh, seed in us more united purpose around like our values, what we care about, our interests and resources, which is very important. Having a clear structure and thinking about how to build actually a good structure that has that is respectful of people uh, that has a clear uh, purpose, norms and roles 
as well as a well coordination between these different teams in the snowflake is something that is important. And of course, strategizing, having a creative strategy, as well as designing effective action, action that can be that can translate the strategy into tactics, into creative actions that can actually make us do the work. So these five practices are the practices of organizing uh, that Leading Change uh, Network teaches uh, and that we hold uh, dearly in terms of our research and uh, development. And for all of these uh, uh, five practices to make us reach our strategic goal, some of them are like building power. We call them, you build your power. Storytelling is seen as a building power uh, practice because when you know your story and you know, you know how to communicate it, you're building your internal power. And then there are practices like strategy and action where you're using your power uh, towards your opponent or whatever goal you're trying to reach. And we have a sixth practice that is coaching that we consider an umbrella uh, uh, practice because leadership is enabling others. And for you to enable people, whether in the craft of storytelling or the craft of one-to-one -one meetings or the craft of strategizing, coaching is always ongoing. It's always alive for you to keep coaching people and asking the right questions for us to reach, uh, to, to uncover the, the challenges we have. Um, yeah, thank you for the chat. I haven't been, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think in many countries, unfortunately, we have these uh, challenges, yeah. So moving, so I'm gonna zoom in more into public narrative. Uh, I call it public narrative or storytelling is like both are the same thing. Uh, Rabbi Hilal uh, said these quotes and I wanna see if, uh, does anyone uh, mind reading out loud for us? so that we hear a, a nicer voice for a while. If I yes. am not for myself, who will be for me? When I am only for myself, what am I? If not now, when? Rabbi Hillel. First century Jerusalem sage. Thank you. Can you say how you pronounce your name? Amuchi or? Yeah, Amuchi. Amuchi, mm. thank you so much. Lovely voice. So, so out of these uh, words of wisdom, uh, uh, I want to go through public narrative. Uh, so to unpack these words uh, and to think about them uh, in more detail. So, so, <clears throat> sorry. So, in general, uh, like it's 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 really about asking yourself, who are you? What are you like? Really, what are you? Uh, what's your calling? What what are you? Why are you doing the work you're doing? But not just that, but also like, if I am not only for myself, what am I? So, who are you working with? You know, who are the other people you're working with? And then the last part being, if not now, when? And uh, so I'm just going to share with you like the three components of public narrative uh, that we, so public narrative as a practice is divided into these three elements, the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. So oftentimes, uh, and we are very specific around when you tell your story, it's not enough that you tell the story of self. Your story of self is good. It talks, it tells me your values. It tells me why you're doing what you're doing. But it's very important for me to also hear who are the group with you? What's your story of us? Who are they? What do they care about? What's their priorities? And it's also important for me, after being motivated by your story of self and your story of us, to know what shall I do? What's the urgency and what's the price of not acting? And if you want me to act, what do you want me to do exactly? And that's where the story of now comes in to actually ask people to take action. So in this framework, in the overall organizing framework, we say that we are trying to move people into action. And for people to move into action, usually they need the conviction of their heart which is their values, 
and for them to know why is this important, for them to find the reference with their heart, with their values, but they also need the conviction with their brain. There's always two ways to see the word, right? Like from the brain or from the heart. And for us to take action, we need both. We need strong strategy, but there's oftentimes a very strong strategy that just stayed on the shelf. Why is that? Is because we didn't get the motivation of the people. We didn't hear the stories. We didn't get them to be motivated around it from values perspective. People didn't get to analyze their, their why they're doing that work uh, or be in relation with other people and create a community to be able to create the change. So in, in all the work that I will be explaining, it's all the aim of getting people to take action. Of course, take meaningful action towards justice, towards change to the positive. And the way to do that is actually to facilitate the why and the how. And public narrative is more in the why. So it's a heart exercise of working on the heart. But again, when we go into the st story of now, we shift a little bit and we start talking about the how and what should we do. Like we call people to action. And uh, what I'm talking about it seems theoretical, but now when we hear an example, you will get uh, more clearer on it. OK. Um, so given that uh, uh, definition, uh, we work through thinking of knowing ourselves, knowing the others, and then creating the story of now. And um, uh, anyone, uh, I just want to ask a question here. Anyone ever been watching a movie and they found themselves crying on it? Happens, yeah, really <laughs> raising hand, yeah. It's common, right? We we get uh, our emotions uh, sometimes uh, when we when we watch a movie and where, where we hear a story, um, and that's because uh, emotions are a reflection that something deep within us there's a value that was touched, and sometimes it's this period of life where I'm like watching this movie around family and like there's something about my family now that this is like sensitive, so I get emotional about it. Uh, uh, so emotions are always tied to our values, and these values are tied to experiences that we've experienced, either now or like in our history. So something is valuable for us because of experience we, we've experienced. They made this uh, research in um, my clinic. They brought in a, two groups of people, one group who has a problem in their brain in the amygdala which is the area in charge of emotions and another group who were like healthy and they made each group make choices. Uh, so, for example, would you uh, two two good uh, choices, like would you rather say the truth or uh, or I don't know, read a book, you know, like if you had this uh, option and uh, people who had uh, no problem at all, they were easily choosing between two good things or two bad things to do. Uh, because for them, it was like, okay, like, you know, maybe uh, honesty is more important or that is more important. But, but for people who had problems in their emotions, it was very hard for them to choose between two good things or two bad things, because that didn't click to a relation with a memory in their brain on an experience they've had or something they've cared about. So they couldn't really value what do they care more about. So emotions are very, very important in us making choices about things uh, and taking action towards things. Um, and like, it's like not by coincidence that the word emotion actually has the word motion in it because we actually take motion, we take action from emotions. Emotions are triggering us to take action. And it's very important to say that when I talk about storytelling or public narrative, I'm not talking about communication or propaganda or fake stories. I'm talking about using real genuine stories and uh, like real emotions. But even though we do like our own personal story, it's good for us to know what are the emotions that actually activate action versus the emotions that inhibits action. So, so for example, if I say a story and I have fear, that's what we call an action inhibitor. A story of fear doesn't make you want to join me, doesn't make you want to be part of it. Um, story of isolation or self-doubt are also like action inhibitors, inertia, apathy. 
So these are emotions on the left side corner of this slide that are that actually inhibit us from taking action. Uh, on the contrary, emotion like urgency makes us take action. Emotion like anger. Anger is a very good emotion. We're not talking about rage, but we're talking about anger. Have you ever acted because you got angry about something being unjust? We probably do, right? Like, I mean, I, I've had incidents where like being angry at something that is really not working in the world or really uh, affecting injustice to someone or, or something around me that made me actually take action. Hope is a very positive uh, emotion in terms of making us take action. Again, it's also the same with solidarity and you, make, you can make a difference. And for, for leaders of movements, it's very important that when you see the emotion of fear or apathy or isolation, that you actually counter that emotion with the emotion on the opposite side. So if you see a, an emotion of fear, which happens when organizers take risk of their lives or uh, their jobs or whatever to like take action, you need to bring it, bring them a narrative of hope to counterpart that negative emotion that is inhibiting uh, action. And it's very important for you as a leader in campaigns to actually think what, what is the emotion I'm transmitting in the story I'm telling, in the work I'm doing, in how I'm motivating my people to make sure that you can bring more action motivators uh, towards uh, your voice in the right time uh, to bring people to take action. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and see if anyone has thoughts, reflections. I think I have never thought of like how to counter it. Like I've always seen like advertisements and uh, sort of calls to action that appeal to certain emotions like anger and fear, and they don't really work so well, but I've never known how exactly you can counter that but seeing like the chat of you know upper day with anger I you I kind of get a sense of how you can organize people around ideas that oppose that which is really cool thank you yeah thank you and I want to say that like many of these emotions of like isolation and self-doubt and all of that also emerged during the COVID period and I saw very strong narratives of municipality leaders standing up and bringing a, a, a narrative of you can make a difference, a narrative of hope, a narrative of urgency, because there was all these emotions. It's just that instead of like bringing a, a, a narrative of isolation and fear, just bring the opposite for your people. And that made a true difference for people to actually take action and be responsible during the situation. Um, so it's just important for us to remember that at the end of the day, we are humans and emotions are important and our choice of which emotions are we transmitting is also very important. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll move on. Let me share sound. Okay, so in general, any story, I'm sure like you probably read stories, watched movies, any story has this, these components, challenge, choice, outcome. These are the three elements of any story. And it's very important not to miss any one of them. So if I'm telling my story of self, I need to have a challenge. Because if I don't have a challenge in my story, I will appear like a hero. And people don't want heroes. If I tell a story, uh, without an outcome, I only tell you my challenges, I will appear as a victim. And people don't like victims. People want uh, leaders who have made choices in their lives, who have chosen a path that they are on now. So you, you need to make sure that when you tell your story, you have these three areas, the challenge, the choice, and the outcome. Because we're not doing storytelling for media, we're doing storytelling as a process of agency as a process of building power. So it is also on the same pathway of leadership development. I wanna enable you so I coach your story because you actualizing your story, you realizing why are you doing the work you're doing now? What's your story? What's your values? What happened in your childhood? What made you care about X, Y, Z? Is an important part of building your own agency. So that's really important. 
So, and of course, there's always a character, and in the story of self, you are the character. A very common mistake is that people t come and tell a story about their sister or brother. We want you to be the one having that challenge, and what was your choice and your outcome. So you need to think of a story which you were the hero of. What was it? What happened to you? And what, did, what choice have you made? Uh, and of course, there's always the plot, the details. Uh, the more you bring vivid imagery into the story, the more it is memorable for people. And if it's memorable, then they got it, then they receive the emotion that you have. So we always say you need to show your story, not tell it. So visualize it in vivid images as much as you can. And of course, out of every story, there is this moral. What are we taking away from it? So uh, now to just take this theory into practice, I want to show a video. And I want to say, like, I just want to do this uh, trigger warning that uh, this is a video of um, someone called James Croft. Uh, he was a student at Harvard Kennedy School, and he did this video as part of like studying with Marshall, doing this public narrative work. It's a complete narrative that has self us now, but it has a description of suicide um, uh, relevant to LGBTQ uh, groups. Uh, but so just to be like aware, if anyone feels they are not ready to like um, uh, listen to it for any personal circumstances, you can just put the voice down. Um, it's going to be five minutes. Uh, so I'm going to put this on for five minutes and then we will debrief it and then go on a break. So I just want to like uh, before I play it. So this is a complete narrative, self, us, now, but it's not ordered in this order, like starting with self, then us, then now. Like he does it in a very artistic way, mixing them. I want you to listen carefully, and then I will ask you around to debrief it around where did you hear his story of self? Where, who is the us? What about the us did you know? And what's the story of now? What's the urgency he's asking us to do? Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to play it, and just give me the thumbs up if you hear it. It's just like Wow, that works. That's amazing. 6.12 seconds. That's about how long it takes to fall 604 feet. And 604 feet is about how far Tyler Clementi fell after he jumped off the George Washington Bridge. Now, as we know, he took his own life because live video footage of him having a romantic encounter with another man was streamed live on the internet by his college roommate. Just one of a very long list of young people who have taken their lives because of anti-LGBT bullying in the past few weeks. Now, I never experienced anything like what Tyler went through when I was at school, but I was bullied for being gay. You see, when I was a kid, I was a ballet dancer. And every week, I squeezed into a leotard and blue shiny hot pants. It was uh, quite an outfit. And I spent an evening practicing demi-pies and pirouettes. And I loved it. I loved the discipline. The music played on the old piano. The feel of the wood beneath my feet. I even secretly quite liked the outfit. <laughs> but my schoolmates and some of my teachers didn't like ballet as much as I did. And one of my teachers, a PE teacher, used to make fun of me. He used to say how girly I was, how dancing is not something that a boy should do. I remember the sneer on his face as I walked past, and I remember that he was the first person to call me a fag, which at seven years old, I didn't really understand. I remember in high school how gay was only ever used as a term of abuse. And I remember one cold morning sitting in assembly while the principal intoned Homosexuals deserve our pity and our prayers. And I sat among hundreds of other boys thinking I was all alone in the world and that I was the only one who had this problem. Now, not everyone may have experienced something like that, but we all know, I think, what it means to feel alone, to feel like there's no one on our side. Perhaps you were too tall and the short kids made fun of you. Or perhaps you were too short and you got it from the taller ones. Or perhaps you are too smart or too dumb, or from the wrong side of town, or the wrong race. We all know, I think, even if just for a moment, what it feels like to think that there's no one on your side, to think that no one has your back. And all of us, 
if there are young people in our lives that we care about, can agree that we don't want this to happen to them. Imagine, if you can, what it must be like to come home and see a strange shape hanging from a tree in your backyard, twisting in the wind, the creak of the branch as it bends beneath the weight, and that feeling in your gut as you get closer and you realize what it is hanging there, who it is, who it was, because that was Seth Walsh, 13, who hung himself from a tree in his backyard. It was Billy Lucas who hung himself at his grandmother's house. And it was Raymond Chase who hung himself in his door. And it could have been your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, or your friend. It could have been one of us. So I know, I, I only came out in March this year. After 10 years, 10 years after I first told my parents that I thought I was gay. And in those 10 years, I lost a lot of opportunities to make a difference. I was a high school teacher, and every day I wasn't out was a day I deprived a gay student of a positive role model. And I'm not willing to waste any more time. I have to act now. We have to act now. Because it isn't enough to let these things happen and then mourn them afterwards. We need to catch these kids before they jump. And there is something we can do to help as a start. Journalist Dan Savage has started a campaign, the It Gets Better campaign, to send messages of hope to teenagers who are being bullied because they're gay or for whatever reason, that they should have hope for their future, that they do have something to live for. And I think that if we made such a video, as Harvard students with glittering careers ahead of us and sparkling degrees, then we could make a difference. So we need people to hold a camera, to share their stories, to do editing and sound, to stand in a big group and say it gets better. No contribution is too small. And if you want to get involved and you're an undergraduate, talk to Tevin here. Do you mind waving? Oh, hi. And he'll tell you how to get involved. And if you're a graduate student or if you just want to come along from 5 to 7 p.m. in the Elliott Lyman room in Longfellow Hall at the Education Schools campus, stand up and say we're standing with these kids. We've got your back. Let's catch them before they jump. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Um, yeah, I left saying a count, uh, uh, narrative of hope to counter fear. Uh, that's true. There is hope. Where did you find hope? What was the sources of hope in this narrative? Oh. It wasn't about this. This just made me weepy, very moving. Um, I wrote there a narrative. When, when you mentioned that we need a narrative of hope to counter fear, I found that very precious. So I just. Uh -uh. But uh, about James Croft's thing, when he said in the end, when he said, um, let's, let's, Let's keep their backs, that's the word he used. Yeah, let's, let's catch them before they fall. The one before that he said the, in the sentence, let's, uh, let, let's, let's, some, that was so moving. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. let's catch them before they fall and the sentence before that. Yeah, yeah. I wanna, yeah, let's I, let's have their backs or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. He said something like let's, that. Let's be the ones who have their backs. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely hope. Definitely, yeah. Frank, you had your uh, hand up. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I wanted to say almost a similar thing that, that the hopeful part was that he said we can stop them before they fall. You know, this is not this is not destined to happen. If we speak out, if we organize. We are Harvard graduates, or we become Harvard graduates. If people listen to us, so that was sort of hopeful. It's a desperate situation, but it was it was possible to change it. Yeah, it is possible to change it. So you, and that's what, where you feel the hope, and that's where like there is hope in this story. Um, I want to ask, uh, do you remember where he begins? Does he begin of a story of self, us, or now? Do you remember how he started his narrative? He started with, uh, uh, I think, with describing all the all the bullying. 
and the examples of uh, of, of kids that, that took their lives uh, uh, when they were bullied. Yeah, then I think he moved to himself only after that. So that's like describing people who are getting, who are having, uh, who are committing suicide. Is that, uh, in your opinion, uh, Frank, story of self, us or now? Um, in the beginning, it wasn't maybe super clear that it was a story of us. You sort of assumed it was it was him where he was part of that. He would be part of the LGBT community, but I'm not sure if he said that in the first sentences. So in a sense, it's a story of now, like this is happening in the world. This is what yeah. we see all around us. This is something that we should respond to. Definitely. So he started with the now, and I see that also in the chat. He started with the now of creating urgency. Now is creating urgency. Now is giving us the image. And then uh, when he moves to himself, uh, what kind of story did he, like, what, what did you know about him? He was really into the ballet and he was bullied because of it uh, at the school, even uh, by teachers, that uh, it is too girly and that boys shouldn't do something like this. Yeah. Um, but he was really into it. He was like, what, what did that thing he really liked in, in his life? What did that feel for you? Like, like, uh, what did you know about him, about his values? Uh, I think that uh, it is a person who um, who doesn't really care about someone's opinion, and that uh, he is making everything uh, which uh, what can be good for him for his I don't know mental health, something like this. And that he is trying to help others to, uh, to to also do things like him. Yeah, no, they're very good. And I see Elif also talking about uh, the challenge he faced. So you, we saw a challenge choice outcome in his story of self. So the story of self has challenge choice outcome. The us has the same. And the now is basically the challenge in the world, the choices we have in the world and the us. So that's the, these are the elements of the three um, components, um, uh, and like a good story usually has a balance between the hope and the challenge, and that's what we saw. Like when he talks about the ballet dance, there's something fun about how he says it, and there's something human about that discipline of the piano and how he loved music and how he loved, you know, uh, art and all of that. So. There's something that is human that makes us also balance the challenge of him being called a bag and bullied with an emotion of happiness, of humanity, of something that makes us also relate because we relate to humanity, we relate to happiness, we, we relate to um, you know, having a, a source of motivation as a child. So we could picture him because he went into the details. Uh, anyone remembers very vivid details in the imagery he tried to create because he was very strong in showing, not telling. Any one image that you remember from, yeah, Elif is saying blue leotards, anything else you remembered about his story or the story of now that was vivid? Yeah, the creaking of the piano. Good. Yeah, yeah, the feel beneath his foot. Yeah, he was so specific. He, and that was what made you now remember it. If he just told you, I, I, I was in, uh, I was studying ballet without any details, we would never have remembered it at this point. Okay, after watching five minutes, but the fact that he showed us his story didn't tell it, it makes us still remember the details of it. So I want to ask what, uh, what was the story of us? What's the us he's like, so the us is basically the people you're talking to. So was he talking to LGBT community? What, what's the us he was talking to? Who are the people he was talking to, addressing in his narrative? Uh, okay, Frank, and I need, uh, after Frank, someone new to step up. Frank, go ahead. I'm gonna step down after this. I really like the concept. Uh, I, 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 I assumed he was going to speak maybe to the local LGBT community among students, and then I realized his audience was a bit wider, so it was basically everyone, and he said everyone can be bullied, so we all know what it means that, that you can be bullied, and we all want this to stop, and that includes basically everyone, every well-thinking human being should want this to stop, 
uh, and then it can happen to all of us. And then he sort of goes to, we can also also all, all act. So he includes a very wide group of people who he says can all act because of their role as, as Harvard students. Fantastic. And, and he like, and even he didn't like narrow it down to if you were bullied, because maybe not everyone has been bullied. He, he went to even more universal feeling and he said, have you ever felt alone? Has anyone here in this room felt alone? Like that's something that any human in the world has ever felt it like. So he, he, he widened the scope of who could join him to be anyone in the world who've ever felt alone. And he, like, like you were saying in the chat, he said like, you could be the shorter person or like coming from another town or the longest person or like, you know, so like he, he made a different categorization that can fit us all, right? Um, so that's how he brought in a, an us that is diverse and open. And that's very smart because usually the us you bring is the us you will recruit. So if I am a group of, uh, if I'm a woman and I stand up and I tell a narrative that only talks about mothers and women, I will only recruit mothers and women. But if I say that there's a man with us or there's a, a gay guy, or then I bring more diversity to whoever will join us. So thinking about how you describe the us will bring you the us you need. So you need to be mindful of what kind of us you create. Um, so I want to go to the now a little bit. You all started saying that he started with the now. He talked about the suicide. I want to know what else, uh, like what is the ask he asked us to do? Anyone remembers how he ended up his uh, narrative? Gold Zoom, if you, if you don't mind sharing your thoughts. So he ended up his narrative with kind of an invitation the others to join and raise awareness and to, you know, as, as you said, to prevent them uh, from falling. Yeah. What exactly did he ask us to do? Like, how can we join? What should we do? Mm, I might have missed that part. Anyone remembers what was the request? He said there is a campaign going on. It's called the It Gets Better campaign. And... Uh, if you are an undergraduate, then yeah. you come and join this way. And if you're a graduate student, you can come and meet them in the evenings between five to seven. Yeah, very good. So for some group, it was like, come to this meeting to like, see how you can contribute. And like Wistik is saying in the uh, chat uh, to make a video. So he said like, no contribution is too small. Make a video, edit, stand in groups or stand alone. Tell them it gets better. Okay. So that was the request. It's very important as an organizer to seize the opportunity of getting people engaged with you, having their emotions in with you to actually make an ask. Because otherwise you're losing the opportunity, you're losing a resource of people's emotions to take action. So you really need to make an ask. And a good ask is specific, is time bound, is only one ask to not confuse people. And it's doable. And it's the first step. So I can tell you, come join the campaign for one year, volunteer. That's a lot for the first one. The first one needs to be a first step. Just give me one step, you know, towards, um, yeah, and tell them it gets better. That's right. I'm going to share screen just to make a refresher. So, um, so on the story of self, so if we zoom in in the first element of the public narrative, which is story of self, the three elements are challenge, choice, outcome. And uh, just a refresher to remind you, uh, we when we tell our story, we want to show, not tell. Um, in a bit, we will go into some practice in breakout rooms to experience uh, doing your own story, because that's going to be a good exercise for you to, thinking, to think through your story. Uh, usually developing your story takes so many iterations, so it's not expected from you today to come up with like your really well made of story, but just to start thinking about it is a good is an important story. Um, so we need to show people not to tell them and we need to make sure not to miss on the outcome of the story, because that will make us a victim and no one wants to join victims. We don't want to miss the challenge because that will make us a hero. And no one wants to be with heroes. People want to be with people who they can relate to, people who they feel are uh, humans. Um, so, uh, so the question is, what's your story of self? 
and uh, I just want to see if anyone is open for me to help them solicit their story uh, like in the group here like in the big room like uh, if someone is open for me to ask them questions and try to find out uh, about their story about their upbringing about of why they're doing the work they're doing now um, anyone open for us to have this like five to ten minute conversation in front of everyone for everyone to learn how the story is actually uh, emerging okay Sagar you're okay let's let's clap for Sagar for the courage of stepping up to get his uh, story coached okay uh, so Sagar um, my question to you is what are you doing now okay so currently I'm uh doing many things i'm a student right now uh, back back uh, i'm student again right now i'm uh, working at the job and i'm again uh, i'm planning for a uh, to establish a sustainable uh, to to establish a sustainable company as well so a student uh, an employee um, and the founder of upcoming uh, company as well okay and uh, like uh, you being at uh, 350 and coming to these trainings uh, like why why did you join them so uh, during the pandemic i realized i, I, I need to continue my education and i have been into uh, a segment of a digital marketing uh, uh, area uh, during the pandemic i actually lost my job and um, my father is retired right, right now he is almost 60 but he's still pursuing his PhD uh, into his favorite subject, which is um, uh, uh, Buddhism. And uh, that actually uh, gave me the uh, courage to pursue my education. Uh, I, I, I'm a physicist, by the way, but uh, uh, I chose my career into digital marketing. Um, and I've been actually planning to pursue my MBA as well, but instead of a MBA uh, during the pandemic, I saw many things um, about the climate, about, uh, about the social justice movement, and um, uh, about the society in general. And that's why I uh, decided to pursue uh, my education into um, a law. Okay, so uh, so why did you choose law? Is law the what you're studying? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, like, tell me more. Like, why? Like, where did that come from? Uh, before the pandemic, uh, uh, I've been running uh, a media agency uh, in my city, Mumbai, and I've been working for not many small scale businesses. Um, uh, I had many dream about to become an entre uh, entrepreneur and um, uh, uh, to, be to become a millionaire and, uh, and, and to have my Ferrari and Rolls Royce. But um, when I actually work with a small scale businesses, that actually sparked my uh, mind out, and um, that actually gave me the, uh, uh, the 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 dynamics of the society of how the businesses are getting established, uh, about the labor law, about the working conditions, about the the risk involved in uh, to start the business. So that actually gave me the whole dynamics about the businesses and uh, that actually stopped me to uh, become uh, uh, the, the greedy, uh, uh, the, the, my, the money oriented person. And um, the, that's the story uh, actually that led me to, uh, uh, to choose the law and to understand the law to uh, help others. Okay, but then uh, uh, Sagar, I'm just curious because like many people probably passed through uh, like, uh, you know, are now studying law uh, or like want to study law, but I want to like, I want you to take us back into more into your life to tell us like, um, uh, so first, like, what's your like that mind shift? So I feel like I feel what you're trying to tell me is that you, there was like a mind shift for you to like that made you now study law, right? Like to move out from thinking business into thinking that I want to study law. But what is it that you um, like? Uh, why is that important for you? Uh, my my father was a government uh, officer. Uh, I raised in the government quarters. Uh, 
all of my other friends were uh, and their family was all into a government sector so that actually nurtured my mind into uh, a established society but uh, when i tried to escape from that uh, when i decided to not to become uh, a government employee and to pursue my career into a private job that actually gave me uh, the the goods and the bads of not having a government or a sustainable job uh, uh, but i think that uh, i feel around that um, Uh, the people who continue the government job, they are getting good, uh, uh, good plan for a living, uh, a, a better housing system, a healthcare system, a transportation facilities, uh, and uh, uh, I'm from India, so the government job actually occupies only two percent of of the population. So when I actually realized that ninety percent, ninety or more than a ninety percent people don't have government job and they are on their own way and they are not getting these benefits of uh, education, healthcare, and um, the food security um, and about the uh, about the climate justice or a social justice thing, that actually um, made me think that. Uh, that uh, i i am a privileged guy and uh, my family is privileged and there are many people who are not privileged so let's make something or uh, let's let's give back to the society and that actually uh, uh, the, the beginning uh, to pursue my education again okay yeah sagar i'm going to go a little bit earlier can you tell me how like where did you grow up uh, i grew up in mumbai Mumbai yeah. city, and how India. many siblings do you have? I do have five sisters, and I'm the only uh, younger brother to them. Okay, interesting. Uh, and w- what did that mean, like, for your upbringing and your childhood? Uh, it was uh, it was quite good, and uh, my my father was a uh, uh, he was an officer, and my mother was a, a, a housewife, so. Uh, I feel that uh, my childhood uh, nurtured very well, uh, just like an average kid only. Yeah, and but do you remember? So, like, I mean, what I try to get into in my uh, probing is that I'm trying to get into a moment, um, a defining moment, or like an important moment in your childhood. Uh, so maybe if you reflect back on your life. like especially between the age of like 5 to 15 was there any moment where you had to step up or do something differently or take leadership in what you were doing uh, if i if i continue to uh, explain more uh, uh, maybe you guys are not from uh, uh, india so the, the, so if, if you consider about the racism for example so there, there is a thing in india called uh, caste system Yeah, of course, I know about it. Yeah. So uh, my family, uh, or, or, or the the origin of my family, um, uh, are are from not that privileged or uh, privileged background, and that actually I sense uh, during my childhood that that this is something I didn't knew that 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 was the class uh, or a caste, but that factor actually affected me during my childhood. um and uh, as i as i told you that i i grew up uh, with the similar kind of a class people so the class was not the issue but the caste was yeah and how was it like can you say an incident a specific moment what happened exactly it was not brutal to be frank it was not brutal but um, w- w- when we friends come around and uh, we talk uh, or we share a uh, the things about our culture and uh, such things so uh, i actually uh, felt that there is something that they are not happy with uh, my history or my culture so that actually uh, separated me uh, during the childhood yeah like, it's such so and so community or so and so background so uh, i i felt that separation part uh, during the childhood but um, to be frank um, uh, I, i as i was doing good in the studies and uh, and 
uh, I consider, uh, though my family is Buddhist, I consider myself uh, an atheist. And I was the one who actually uh, uh, grasping the scientific knowledge and the, uh, and the more progressive knowledge. So I was actually considering myself a very much privileged and very much um, uh, intellectual uh, uh, instead of my uh, uh, other people. So that actually gave me the courage that uh, whatever I'm um, the, the path uh, onto, I, I, I'm, I'm doing great, great and greater than others. So that actually yeah. uh, gave me courage. So Sagar, I just want to say that when we try to reflect on our story, like the fact that you now remember this cast challenge means that it was real at that point, even if you're over it now and you know like you've overcome that or whatever has happened. But for us to actually hear it in a story, we need a moment, an incident. But now there's no time for it. But like, just think about it. If you reflect back on that moment and if you try to describe it to us, just like how, like the example of James Croft or any other story where people bring in a specific moment of challenge so that it, you make it real for us on what exactly was it like? What did you feel as a child in that moment? And what choice have you made? So again, remember the three elements, the challenge, the choice, and the outcome. And sometimes the outcome of a challenge is not so bad. Like it's like we overcome it, we get over it. We are in a good place now, which is good. It's also a good story to tell. But just like think about these three elements and try to go back to that specific moment. Instead of telling me, I had a problem with, that has to do with cast, just tell me the problem. Like just describe it. What happened? Where were you? What happened exactly? How did you feel, etc. Okay. But so that's what I'm trying to probe into. But now what we will do is, um, so in five minutes, we will go into breakout rooms. Uh, and in these five minutes, I want you to just sit down and try to reflect on your story on paper or on like whatever way you want, you find useful. You can just draw it because basically you want to tell people your story as if you're looking at a photo album and you're telling a story about your origin story, like what was your parents doing? What do you, you know, what is it about you? The challenge as an image, think of it as a photo album and you're trying to give me that image. What was it? What's the context? The choice, think of it as an image. What was that point? Where were you? The outcome. So sometimes even drawing these three, four pictures that you want to tell me about is easier than writing them down for the sake of the exercise. And now the exercise is only on the story of self. So the exercise is for you to try to start on thinking of the story of self. Uh, at 1635, we will open the breakout rooms and you will be in teams of three or four uh, to work through this exercise. Uh, I'm gonna uh, make a slideshow. You will go into 15 minutes in the rooms and in these 15 minutes, um, or maybe 20 based on the rooms, if we can put people in groups of three, we will make it a 15 minutes uh, breakout. Uh, and each person will tell their story for two minutes and for three minutes, uh, the rest of the team will share what resonated with them. Be careful, people are putting their stories out, they're putting their hearts out, so you need to first put your ears out, but also to be uh, genuine and to be not judgmental on whatever the person did in their lives. The only thing you can respond with is, what resonated with me? Oh, that moment that you said, the vivid image, try to pick the vivid image from whatever story they told so that you bring it back to them when they repeat their story, they should say it, okay? And if you just have any feedback around challenge, choice, outcome, like if you feel one of these three elements is weaker than the other, maybe you can just give feedback on your choice could have been better or like, you know, you can maybe tell us more about the choice. Maybe you can tell us more about the uh, outcome like if you felt one of these three elements is still missing a little bit uh, i'm gonna put it in the chat uh, and now we're gonna like put on five minutes on the clock for you to try to reflect on your um on your story of self welcome back everyone is getting back i want you to share a reaction so on zoom at the bottom you see something called reactions Share a reaction that shows us how you feel after this uh, 15 minutes breakout room. Okay, hearts. Wow. Someone went into the heart area. That's good. That's good. Ah, oh, I'm loving that. <laughs> okay, some funny stories, it seems. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, love it. Love it. That's lovely. Okay, so I want to hear some. Uh, so what I usually do at the end of every session uh, is do a quick evaluation. 
so I want us, so what we're going to do, we're going to do a quick evaluation and then we're going to go into some learning. So I want to hear your learning. What have you learned today with me in these two hours? Uh, but before we go into the uh, evalu in the into the learning, I want to hear some evaluation. So what worked well in this session? So what facilitated your learning? What worked well? I'm going to hear a few voices and then move into what could be become better. Uh, and please, because we are like tight on time, just unmute and speak up or write in the chat. I love your story about the salad. What what is it called? Nefa. Oh, it was beautiful. My story, Mia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's called knafe. Yeah, the <laughs> the dessert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like celebrating a loss. That was really cute and got to the heart. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, what else? Interaction. Was? Interaction. It was very well done. Okay. Good. The, the session that we just had was excellent. Um, it, we, we, it was quick, but it was meaningful. And, and I learned a lot. And just making me think through that, I came up with a story I never had before. Ah, fantastic. That's what I wanted to hear, like of coming up with stories. Um, what else? And I'm loving that you're all speaking up now. Uh, okay, I hear on the chat, uh, video is inspiring, analyzing it, a clear structure, clear pictures to illustrate, cool, um, clear explanation. Okay, let's go into what can be better. What can we improve for this session? I wish you did this. What do you wish I'd have done? Yeah, we could do a whole day. Yes, this workshop is, is done on a full day workshop. It's done on four months workshop as well. Uh, there is the extended version of it, and I hope you can join me on one of those. Um, other thoughts, uh, any tips to improve? I wish everyone like turned on their videos and we had more uh, voices heard. Uh, that would have been helpful. Other thoughts? maybe more sort of interaction at the beginning as well um, to get everyone to, um, yeah, more engaged and ready to listen. Yeah. So uh, I told you that uh, I'm actually working for uh, one project which is more close to environment. And I've been doing this uh, since the pandemic. And I realized that whatever you've been um, explaining is, I've been actually practicing uh, way before and that actually gave me uh, uh, the exact route of where, where should I actually improve myself so insightful thank you thank you okay that's great to hear so now I want to hear some learning so if you can reflect for like a few seconds on what is your main takeaway like you're leaving this room hopefully learning something new what is your biggest uh, takeaway uh, and I want everyone to chat it in, but I want to hear at least two voices to speak it up. Uh, and for those who asked, what's the course? There's this course now uh, at Harvard, but then at uh, Leading Change Network, we run a lot of courses for public narrative and for organizing all the time. So if you subscribe to us, you will get to see what, what are we offering. Uh, but I want to hear like, what's, what's your biggest takeaway? Um, Liki, do you want to speak up? Tell us what's your, like, what are you leaving the room with? I think that each story should uh, at least have uh, a challenge, a choice, and an outcome. Fantastic. Challenge, choice, outcome, the elements of story. Great yeah. takeaway. Uh, what else? Uh, Mercy, do you want to tell us what's your takeaway? I love the definition of leadership. I think for for the longest time we've had leadership as just the people being at the forefront, getting all the glory. But this thing about, you know, accepting responsibility and having a shared vision that all can work towards and weathering uncertainty, that I think is a kind of leadership that we need and that needs to become the norm other than this other thing. Yeah, I love it. Thank you, Mercy, for bringing the leadership definition. Lovely. Uh, something else, someone has a like a different uh, space of uh, learning. We can have one more voice. Uh, 
Victoria, do you want to speak up? Um, I guess I was um, quite inspired by um, the sort of uh, structure that we were given um, to help our stories uh, feel more engaging engaging to our audience and uh, the fact that it's so universal and we can all um it, it sort of reminds me of the fact that we all have shared experiences no matter how diverse our backgrounds are and um, that was very powerful thank you with that uh, i want to say thank you for all of you for like uh, really joining me today and uh, please, uh, I, I have like the LCN link uh, join if you want to like become a member or subscribe to the newsletter to know what's happening. Uh, and with that, I will uh, pass it on to Lisa to close us off. Uh, you are muted, Lise. Yes, I am. Uh, thank you so much, Mais, for such an inspiring uh, session. Um, so the recording and the slides will be made available to all of you. Uh, we'll be sending uh, those um, resources in the coming week. Um, if you have any other question or anything uh, you need regarding this training or any other training that you might attend this week, uh, you can uh, reach out to me. I'm putting my email in uh, the chat box. Um, we also have put together a feedback form uh, so that we can hear from you on what you thought of uh, this session. Uh, and also, if you would like a certificate of attending this training, we can make that happen for you. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to share is, uh, yeah, a reminder that um, this is actually only the second uh, training of a whole uh, program that we're running this week. So uh, if you want to see what else you might be able to attend in the in the coming days, you can see it on our website just there. Um, and yeah, just wanted to say thanks again to all of you for attending. Thank you, Dave, for the uh, support with tech and uh, a huge thank you to Maïs for running this training for us. Uh, it was really exciting and inspiring to work with you. Um, and yeah, maybe suggesting that we all unmute in a chaotic uh, goodbye with our real voices. Thank you. 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 Thank you.